Next up, we have our second keynote for this morning by John Landon. He is the chairman of the Board of Space Angels, the world's largest angel investor network focused on space companies. He is a prominent connector of entrepreneurs and investors in the space industry. Joel also serves as CFO of the asteroid mining venture, Planetary Resources. Please help me welcome Joel Landon. introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking here today at New Space again. Um, I uh, have noticed over the last couple days listening to presentations that some themes emerged at the conference, and one was that the industry is, is maturing, and uh, it, it's time, you know, there's opportunities for entrepreneurs to identify gaps. Um, a lot of the big problems are, are being addressed, and, and it's now uh, uh, other opportunities are emerging. So what I thought I would do today is do something a little different and put forward some ideas for opportunities that might emerge in the industry for innovation, for new businesses. So what are some problems that need solving? You know, we put our heads together at Space Angels to think about you know, what are some ideas or some, some companies that we would love to see entrepreneurs found so that we could invest in them. Uh, and investors typically don't do this uh, type of thing. I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe I'm about to find out. Um, but is inspired by uh, Y Combinator, who has done this. So uh, we got the idea. Y Combinator used to do blog posts called Ideas We'd Love to Fund. So uh, I took a look at those, and, and like I said, we, uh, you know, on our team with some of our uh, active investors and our team at Space Angels came up with a list of ideas we would love to invest in. So the idea here is to you know, spark some conversation and some discussion about uh, cool ideas. Um, I'll only describe them in, in general terms. And uh, some of the ideas are really big ideas. Some of them are, are um, more specific. But generally, it's, it's you know, just some ideas to talk about. So let's try to have fun with it. Uh, first, I would like to give a little bit of background on Space Angels Network. So as was mentioned earlier, we're an angel fund and a venture fund focused on seed and Series A stage space startups. So we've been growing along with the commercial space industry. Uh, we started investing in 2007, so we've been around for 10 years. And uh, in 2016, we were the leading investor in commercial space startups, if you look at the number of investments or the dollar amount. So uh, we led the industry by a wide margin. We invested in 10 companies last year, and we're on track to beat that uh, again for this year. Um, the uh, you know, other, other thing I'd like to mention is we have uh, made a couple of really cool investments. Some of the folks that we've uh, invested in are, are members have invested in are in the room here. We have uh, 250 members uh, worldwide. We've actually capped that number at 250. So uh, right now we are we think that's that's the right number of investors in the group. And at some point we may expand that again. But right now we're kind of maxed out. We think the interest is is uh, very large in the network, and um, we're pretty excited about the future of the industry. Here are a couple companies that we've invested in recently. So uh, Analytical Space, BridgeSat, Oxford Space Systems, Vector, so communication systems, launch systems, um, you name it. You know, so we look at the entire uh, breadth of the space industry and are looking for uh, the best opportunities. So I'd like to talk a little bit before getting into some of the ideas that we uh, came up with, talk a little bit about you know, what makes a space business idea great. And I think the thing I want to emphasize is, you know, Space Angels and, uh, and investors in general, we, you know, we invest in companies, not ideas, not technologies. So we're looking for companies uh, that have uh, a problem and a solution, right? So that's sort of the first thing we look for. So what problem are you solving? Is it hard? Does it cause someone pain somewhere? And is your solution unique? And is it a major improvement from the status quo? We also look at the market opportunity. Uh, if you have a clearly ident identified customer, uh, and is the market large enough to um, provide really high returns for investors, something like a 30 times uh, return on, on money? Is that possible uh, for this particular market opportunity? We look for, or we look at the business model and the economics of the, of the business. How does it work? Who is paying whom for what? Uh, and unlike 
gravity, the force of economics doesn't go away when you go into space. So we, we need a sustainable engine for growth for a company. Uh, and, and we look for that. We want to understand what assumptions entrepreneurs are making about their business model and be able to track sort of how those assumptions turn out over time as the company runs experiments and tries to build that business model. Of course, we look for an experienced team, uh, people who are experienced and passionate about what they're doing. Uh, we like to see a team that's uniquely qualified for that opportunity that they're pursuing. It's like, we're, you know, were you born to do this? Uh, you know, convince us of that. Also, as angel investors, it's very important for us to look at the deal itself and the terms of the investment. Uh, even some great companies um, just don't make sense from an investment perspective sometimes. You know, we look at valuation, the amount of money needed, uh, and, and the amount of money needed is sometimes a misconception for entrepreneurs where uh, some people think needing less money is better. That's not necessarily true. If, if there's a company that needs a lot of money, and we're gonna get really high returns, we want to put a lot of money to work in that company. So it's just sort of the balance of valuation, the amount of money needed. Also the timeline, and like I said before, the potential for really high returns. And again, I wanted to reiterate, sort of before we get into the ideas we'd love to fund, that we don't invest in ideas, we invest in companies. So given that, uh, it's actually kind of a hard uh, uh, list of things for an entrepreneur, you know, it's a big challenge to create a company that sort of meets all these criteria and uh, puts together a stellar investment opportunity for investors. So that being said, it's a little bit of a disclaimer um, before just rattling off some ideas, because it's a lot easier to rattle off ideas than it is to build a company. Okay, so the 2017 edition of Ideas We'd Love to Fund. This is the first edition of this. It may be the last, but maybe not, we'll see. <laughs> Depends on how this goes. <clears throat> Just again, another disclaimer. <laughs> this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's, we, we brainstormed. Uh, I, I really expect this list to be put to shame by the actual entrepreneurs out there who come up with even better, awesome ideas in space. Um, and again, you know, it's, the great idea is only step one of a thousand. Uh, we invest in companies and try to make this fun. Um, we took, uh, I think in the space industry, it's, it's sometimes easier to predict what's going to happen in 50 years than what's going to happen in five years. So some of these ideas, uh, you know, there's an unspecified timeline on here. But you know, there's, uh, you know, the expectation is that these are gaps in the market that we see coming at some time in the near future, and uh, we'd love to see entrepreneurs take a crack at it. So some of the key themes that we came up with, we tried to put, uh, put them together. Small satellite systems and space data. So this you know, is a great follow-on from the last presentation. Uh, we think there is uh, still a huge need for additional uh, Earth observation data and space data and processing of that data and the small satellites to collect that data. So that shouldn't come as a shock to anyone. We also think that there's going to be a big opportunity for human space flight enablers. So if you listen to Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, you know, and, and I, I do and I, I believe that we are going to be a, a civilization that has millions of people living and working in space. So if that's going to be true, then we're gonna need a lot of things. There's a lot of problems to solve before that, not just rockets. So we'll talk a little bit about what some of those enablers might be. <clears throat> and also building and servicing that in-space economy. So if, if we're gonna have commerce and, and business and space stuff happening in space for space, lots of cool ideas can come from that. So we also looked at not just sort of the analytical view of the industry and uh, try to sort of draw a linear line from where we are today to what we'll need tomorrow. We looked at science fiction and other you know, cool ideas that uh, we think uh, ought to be worked on by entrepreneurs. Okay, so without further ado, and I'm not gonna put a list of ideas written on the screen, I'm just gonna talk to them so that I can deny them later. So we think, like I said, satellite systems and space data, plug and play satellite systems. We think the uh, small satellite industry has developed, uh, like most new industries, is very vertically integrated. So companies are, have to build their own stuff, their own solar panels even, their own reaction wheels, their own power systems, propulsion systems. So we think the, the technology is, is gonna mature and there'll be opportunities for entrepreneurs to provide some of those systems um, as, as a you know, part of a supply chain that develops for satellites especially comm systems, position navigation and timing systems, power and propulsion systems. Uh, just in general, in-space communication systems and services, either to communicate, take data from space down to Earth or from space to space, 
communication is an interesting area. Uh, we think there's opportunities for more space data as a service companies and Earth observation, like I mentioned, and I think the uh, previous speaker uh, validated this, where we need more infrared, hyperspectral, radar, uh, other, even more optical uh, Earth observation. Uh, there's just still a demand for that data. <clears throat> and then also the data management and distribution platforms that process that data and help make sense of it, like Orbital Insight. Um, I think there's also an opportunity for disruption of the traditional geo uh, communication satellite market. So the, the technology to get geosynchronous satellites into orbit is being disrupted, but the market for the big satellites uh, is not yet. So I think there might be an opportunity there. I'm skipping ahead here. So on to human spaceflight enablers. You know, I think there's some really cool technology in uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and human hardware interfaces that could be really interesting and useful in space applications. So how do we use uh, some of the AR, VR technologies that are being developed in gaming or, or, or for industry on Earth, how do we use that to enable space operations? I'm also really interested in using you know, sort of teleoperation technology. How do we make astronauts' jobs easier, both you know, in space and spacecraft or on the surface? Uh, interested in bio-augmentation and ways to like really do cool things you know, to make jobs easier in space. Uh, also, a big uh, opportunity might be in astronaut health. So, you know, I'm starting to, well, I forget what movie this one's from, but it's, a, it's like a uh, uh, medical pod. But the idea here is astronauts need to stay healthy, especially if they're going to be in space for long periods of time. So we need health monitoring, uh, medical interve intervention technology, uh, and also mental health and software and hardware to help uh, astronauts tolerate long-duration space flight, both physically and mentally. So that's kind of an interesting area. Um, we also think there's opportunity for sort of the um, supply chain and value chain for habitats in space. So spacesuits, um, you know, what do we need to support multiple private space stations and space habitats, either on a surface or in, in orbit? Uh, you know, what else? What else do people need, you know, in habitats? All kinds of things. Uh, food production. Really interesting idea uh, where there's opportunities for entrepreneurs maybe take a crack at that. Uh, you know, one idea that I, oh, this, yeah, food production. So one idea that I think is really interesting that you see in just every uh, space movie are these hibernation pods. And again, so this, is, this one's kind of out there. But just start thinking about uh, human space flight in different ways and what's going to happen when we have millions of people living and working in space. So moving on to sort of building and servicing the in-space economy. So if we have industries operating in space, what are we going to need? And I think uh, an area, or we think an area that's, that's of interest right away is in-space material processing, especially autonomous material processing. Uh, can you take some sort of material and process it into something else using robotic, chemical, or even biological means to process ore or rock or, or regolith? Uh, there's also opportunities for material transport and logistics. How do we get things from one space, one place in space to another place? Uh, this could be a service opportunity or technology opportunities uh, to make that uh, viable as people want to do things like refuel in space and do distributed launch. We're going to be needing to move more stuff around uh, in space. Uh, another interesting opportunity here in this uh, um, topic is, is, you know, down mass from LEO. I mean, we, we can put stuff into space, but we're still a real challenge to get stuff back down. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what all the applications might be for that, but um, it's something that we don't see people working on. Uh, also, astrodynamics as a service might be interesting. You know, there's, uh, in order to get spacecraft on one, from one place to the other, especially if we're, if we're venturing beyond Earth orbit, um, there's you know, should be better systems in place and technology and software for uh, designing those missions. I think it's mostly uh, left to be to an art uh, art form at this time, not not so much a science that's repeatable or could be offered as a service. So robotics, uh, I think there's opportunities and there'll be a need to have robotics to manipulate things and materials in space and just to do simple tasks. So robots that can take a rock from one place and put it into a, a container or things to grab onto things. Um, you know, if you've read the, uh, the book by Neil Stevenson, Seven Eves, you know, all these little robots going around really uh, is, is inspiring, actually, to see what can be done or what might be able to be done with robotics in space to help us do the jobs that we need to do out there. Also, in space manufacturing, of course, 
Uh, we've, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that in the industry. We think it's a big opportunity. Um, being able to, uh, especially in a world where we're, we're sourcing materials from space and don't have to bring it all up from the ground, we're gonna need technologies to do stuff with that material. So we should be able to build simple things first, like fuel tanks in space, or, or even antenna reflectors, uh, or solar panels. Um, be able to produce stuff, uh, alloys, agriculture, optics, stuff that we can produce in space that has some unique value that we can then bring back down to Earth is an interesting opportunity. Uh, and also space-based platforms. So um, maybe there's, there's opportunities, you know, for it's thinking more or less, less like a space station here, more of an unmanned platform to hook stuff onto or maybe it's some kind of uh, distributed satellite system. Um, orbital debris management or removal, I think you know, there, there is an opportunity here. There's certainly a problem at some point. It becomes a problem, so we're looking for interesting ideas on how to tackle that, that idea. But also along these same lines, waste and reuse, waste, reuse, and disposal. You know, we're gonna have stuff in space that we don't need anymore. What do you do with it? Is there ways to reuse it, to recycle it, to get rid of it? interesting challenge that might hopefully spark some ideas. And then the satellite servicing value chain. You know, if we're going to be able to have refueling in space and, and satellite servicing, um, there's, there's technologies and services and software and hardware that will be required to enable that, uh, those activities that take place. So those are some ideas. Like I said, there's some gaps in the market that we might see coming down the road. We'll probably make, make some glaring uh, um, uh, omissions here. Uh, I hope this will inspire some thought and some dialogue and disagreements about what may, might be coming next in the, the commercial space industry. You know, at Space Angels, we're looking forward to hearing from entrepreneurs uh, who identify hard problems and have unique solutions to, to solve them. So this is a challenge you know, to entrepreneurs to take on some of these ideas or, or better ones and uh, let's work together to make them real. So now I'll take uh, questions or ideas. But I have the right to cut you off. Hey Joe, thanks so much for a great talk. I, I'm curious as you guys think about increasing deal flow, mm -hmm. 10 deals in a year is, when, that, when that's industry standard, that's still relatively small compared to millions of people living and working in space. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the preconditions for hundreds of deals a year? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I think you, you have to you know, uh, crawl before you can walk. I think there's uh, still a couple things missing before we get to that point and it is amount of capital and a, a amount of people just working on this. I mean, the, the industry is still relatively new compared to other industries. So if you look at software or gaming or virtual reality, or maybe virtual reality is a better example where it's, it's, there's less companies. I'm not sure how many virtual reality investments there are in a year, um, maybe 100. Uh, so I think you look at as industries develop, um, opportunities are identified and then those companies go out and build something and then those companies create new opportunities. So it's almost like a uh, uh, you know, exponential growth where you know, SpaceX or Blue Origin creates a capability and then that capability creates opportunity for other entrepreneurs and then five people try to go after that. And then those five companies create opportunities that 10 companies wanna go after. So uh, that's part of it. And also just the, uh, the attraction of capital to the industry. So we're seeing that pick up really rapidly. Um, but I think as companies mature, develop, and are successful. The more successful companies we have, the more investors will want to come in and get a piece of the action. So we're seeing that start to pick up now, but it's just gonna take a little bit more time. Uh, there was a Canadian astronaut that wrote a book about his experiences on the space station. And the thing that jumped out at me from that book is how user hostile the space station systems were and the training burden and risk that it generated. They have to memorize an encyclopedia of procedures, warning indicators, and appropriate responses. It seems to me that there, an opportunity you might look out for is somebody who could create user-friendly interfaces. Yeah, that's a great one. So I, I really like that idea. I think that definitely was missing from the list. Uh, user interface. I mean, it's a lot of work has been done on user interfaces in, in the internet world and also in manufacturing and, and industrial world. Um, 
you know, I haven't been to the space station yet, but I've heard that it is complicated stuff up there. So how do we make that easier for non-professional astronauts to operate spacecraft safely and, and reliably? I think that's a great idea. Um, I have a question regarding orbital debris removal. I know there's a lot of people who have been looking into it, but where do you see in terms of the customers who would actually pay for that service of having the orbital debris removed? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I'm, I've been skeptical of this, uh, of the problem. Um, I don't want to get myself in trouble, but like, you know, space is big, and, and yes, there is debris, but it's not causing a, a big problem for anybody at the moment. I mean, maybe it will in the future. I think the, the n more near-term opportunity is people who want to get that, you know, don't call it debris, call it like an abandoned resource. So there's uh, even people on Earth who are, are mining electronics and, and taking out the materials and, and um, sort of recycling electronics for, to get value out of them. You know, it, it, it makes even more sense in space. If that can make money on Earth, well, it could definitely make money in space. To go out and get a, a dead satellite and repurpose it, recycle it, reuse that material and uh, you know, capture some of the value from it. That might be the first thing. Okay. Cool. Thanks.